On the 27th of November 1989, Avianca Flight 203 takes off on a routine flight from Bogota International Airport in Colombia. Five minutes later, the Boeing 727 is ripped apart by a massive explosion. A hundred and ten people are killed. The death certificates read, cause of death, blunt trauma due to falling from aircraft. The plane exploded in midair and then crashed. And I am sure that while the plane was going down, many people were still alive on that plane. Colombian accident investigators soon established that this was no tragic accident. There was a cassette recorder where somebody was duped into believing that when they maintained a certain altitude that they would turn on that cassette recorder and they would receive certain instructions. And what it really was, was an explosive device. The Colombian authorities realized the target of the attack was presidential candidate Cesar Gaviria, who canceled his flight at the last minute. Gaviria has staked his political career on denouncing Colombia's most infamous cocaine godfather, Pablo Escobar. Imagine one man ordering the destruction of an aircraft, and well over 100 people on board had to perish because of his one desire to kill one man. Two of the dead held US passports. Escobar's indiscriminate slaughter has laid him open to the full weight of American justice. There was always a big effort to capture Pablo Escobar, but this placed it on a worldwide scale, because at that point in time, you can charge somebody with terrorism, which creates a much, much greater jurisdiction when it came to American authorities and charges that you could pursue against an individual. The destruction of Flight 203 is the latest outrage in a brutal criminal career that began when Escobar was just a boy. The son of a farmer and a school teacher, the future drug lord grew up in the dangerous streets of Medellin in the northwest of Colombia. He initially started robbing gravestones from cemeteries and shaving the names off and then reselling them. He was known to local law enforcement. He was a car thief. He was a bit of a thug, a uh, juvenile delinquent, if you will. Uh, that was his background. But he soon realized there was a better way to make big bucks, smuggling cocaine. At the time, cocaine was grown and processed in Chile, Peru, and Bolivia. Then the marijuana smugglers of Colombia began to take an interest in this more profitable drug. They started to bring in cocaine from Peru, from Bolivia, and converting it into cocaine hydrochloride. And then from there, they had access to the Caribbean Ocean, and they were able to use some of the Caribbean islands as transshipment points into the U United States, principally as Southern Florida. By 1985, eight million Americans are hooked on the cocaine flooding into the country from Colombia. The DEA faces an uphill battle to identify the traffickers behind the surge in demand for this new must-have drug. The 1980s were really the boom era, if you will, of cocaine here in the United States. And for some reason, it became a status symbol. You know, it became a fad, and uh, you were not part of the in crowd unless you had large quantities of cocaine or used large quantities of cocaine. And as a result of that, you know, it became the economic law of supply and demand and the Colombian criminals are probably some of the more astute in the world. And we started to see, you know, emissaries of the cartels from Colombia 
coming into the United States and opening up distribution points, you know, throughout the United States. There was a market for cocaine and uh, there was nobody filling the market. And so Columbia jumped in because they were very well positioned geographically and uh, they had uh, the infrastructure and they had the know-how. At 26, Escobar enters the cocaine business and rises quickly from smuggler to trafficker and then producer. Nothing and no one gets in his way. He was arrested in the early 1980s with 18 kilograms of cocaine by the Colombian National Police. He was let go because he threatened the judge and then he went after the police officers that arrested him and had them all killed. Escobar became very powerful because he was willing to do whatever it took to advance the cocaine business. By the mid-1980s, he is head of the powerful and infamous cocaine organization known as the Medellin Cartel, and the payoff is colossal. Pablo Escobar's organization was huge. He had the money to make it huge. Forbes magazine came out with their richest men in the world, and he was right near the top of the list. So right off the bat, you knew that this man was not a millionaire, he was a billionaire. Escobar flaunts his immense fortune by building a vast luxury estate in the hills near Medellin. The ranch had nine man-made lakes, water slides, life-size dinosaurs made out of uh, fiberglass. We estimate that he easily spent, you know, uh, maybe about $10 million in, in constructing that, that uh, ranch. It made me angry because I knew that the mortar and concrete of that entire structure had come from blood money. The cocaine godfather's tainted millions buy more than just fancy homes. He uses them to win the hearts and minds of the poor, paying for food banks, hospitals, and homes for slum dwellers makes Escobar a hero. Pablo Escobar exploited poverty. But he was doing that not for altruistic, but for very selfish uh, reasons, to make sure that the people weren't selling him out, that they looked upon him as the Robin Hood, uh, and he had places to go and hide then if, if necessary. Escobar is so convinced that his Robin Hood image will make him untouchable, he takes the extraordinary step of entering politics. He wanted to be elected to office, so it would bring some sort of legitimacy to Pablo Escobar. Escobar's money has bought him so much popular support, he's a shoo-in as a local representative to the Colombian Congress, a position that guarantees immunity for past crimes. But then the Escobar roller coaster hits the buffers. In April 1984, the Justice Minister, Lara Bonilla, accuses him outright of bribery and corruption. He has signed his own death warrant. Lado Bonilla leaves his office. He's being tracked by a motorcycle. He's in his car. The motorcycle weaves to the right-hand side of the vehicle. They open up with an Ingram and shoot Lara Bonilla several times in the head. The shooter was 16 years old, and the driver of that motorcycle was 19 years old. That would be equivalent to very young teenagers assassinating the Attorney General of the United States. Lara Bonilla's murder sends shockwaves through Colombia. It seems Escobar has finally gone too far. And then the game changed completely because then Escobar had directly attacked the Colombian government. And that was something that no sitting president, no sitting Colombian government could tolerate. 
he realized he lost his protection. That's when he turned to violence big time. It was almost like he lost his mind with it. Violence became uh, his uh, cause celeb of the day, and if, uh, if you were in his way, you were getting shot. Escobar begins a reign of terror in his Medellin stronghold. This once booming commercial city becomes a killing field. When I arrived in Medellin, uh, I saw that it was a beautiful place. It was a progressive city, you know, a lot of skyscrapers, a lot of construction. But once I was there for a month, I started to see bodies throughout Medellin, you know, and I would leave my house early in the morning and I would see cadavers on the side of the road. And when I returned in the evening, a lot of those cadavers were still there because the police and the local authorities just couldn't keep up with the number of killings that were taking place in Medellin. And it was at, at that time known as the murder capital of uh, Colombia. But one thing still spooks the king of Medellin. The only thing Escobar really, really feared was he feared extradition to the U.S. and he feared DEA as a result of that. He felt that he could work his way around the rest. Escobar has been on the DEA's radar since the early 1980s, but its agents need an ironclad case to guarantee his extradition to the U.S. Now he uses his muscle and money to derail their investigation. I finally had to leave the Medellin office because of threats to kidnap me. The DEA aren't the only ones who want Escobar extradited. In August 1989, presidential candidate Luis Galán makes it clear if he is elected, Escobar will be on the first plane out of Colombia. But Escobar strikes first. Galán's murder launches open warfare between Escobar and the Colombian government. I had never, ever seen organized crime try to take down a sovereign government the way he did. Unprecedented. Hasn't occurred since. Escobar's attack on the authorities in Colombia goes hand in hand with a tidal wave of his cocaine reaching the United States. The more that comes in, the more the price goes down until millions are hooked. The addiction rates were skyrocketing. Cocaine became an epidemic of tremendous proportions. The order goes out to the DEA to focus all their efforts on taking Escobar down. Special agent in charge, Joe Toft, finds himself leading the hunt. I thought I was very well prepared for Colombia. Yeah, it didn't take long for me to realize that uh, I wasn't that prepared. From day one out there, you know, the, the seizures, the bombings uh, that Colombia was experiencing because of Escobar and his efforts in trying to intimidate the country, I mean, it was much greater than I thought it was. If anyone can get Escobar, it's Joe Toft. Joe Toft would be classified as a hard ass. He was a compassionate hard ass, but he demanded success. And in this case, he made sure that no stone was left unturned. The DEA has no authority to arrest Escobar in Colombia. Instead, they work hand in hand with an elite new Colombian police unit. This is the Bloque de Búsqueda, or search block. In my opinion, to be a member of the Colombian National Police and assigned to the Bloque de Búsqueda in the search for Pablo Escobar at the time was one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. 
But any unit is only as good as its leader. And the Colombian police find just the man, a lean, no-nonsense police colonel called Hugo Martinez. The leadership has to be from a person that's completely committed to the cause. He's going to know that Pablo Escobar is going to try and hurt him through his family. And uh, Martinez proved to be that man. Martinez has a personal score to settle. In 1989, Escobar's men murdered his best friend. His task is immense. Informers working for Escobar inside the Colombian National Police threaten to reveal every move he makes. He's a very fine, noble man, a great leader, um, a man of undoubted integrity, and I think that very much helped to, to keep a lid on the, the, the confidentiality of what they were doing. The DEA team believe the writing is on the wall for Escobar. But he has lost none of the ruthless instincts that brought him to the top of the Colombian cocaine trade. When I arrived in Colombia, I, I was optimistic. I thought that, uh, you know, within a year or two, we would be able to get Escobar. But um, as time went by, it became clear that the corruption factor, the intimidation factor, uh, made all of the normal uh, police work that we would do up there pretty unlikely to succeed. Despite Colonel Martinez's efforts, Escobar is tipped off by his sources in the police again and again. The local units were completely penetrated by Escobar's people and by those who, who were to benefit by protecting Escobar. Using informants, wiretaps, and surveillance. The DEA build a complete picture of Escobar's network. If they can't get him, they can get what he owns. In order to take down a drug empire, there are numerous approaches that are taken. One of them is to attack the wealth, to seize the assets. Starting with his lavish ranch, all Escobar's property is taken over by the government. Then it's his cash, and his cocaine. He seized vast amounts of money. And the other thing we're doing, we're trying to seize as much of his dope, as much of his cocaine as possible. And we had, I mean, record seizures. Sixty thousand kilos of cocaine and dozens of Escobar's top men are grabbed by the police. The drug lord's retaliation is swift and lethal. Pablo Escobar put a seven hundred dollar bounty for every police officer that was killed, and they just started killing police officers like it was going out of style. And that started a savage war. There was slaughter on the streets. And Medellin became uh, a battleground between the drug traffickers and, you know, civil authorities. Escobar's thugs kill 30 search block officers in just 15 days. By 1991, a total of 457 police have been gunned down in Medellin. The police officers that we trusted out there, that we worked with, were incredible. I mean, they put their lives, their families' lives on, on the line every day. For Joe Toft, the loss of so many Colombian colleagues is almost unbearable. I mean, I remember one particular funeral. I was right close to the casket and the stench because they don't use embalming out there. And I saw this 
poor woman who was pregnant, probably eight months pregnant, hanging onto the casket as they brought the casket and crying with a little baby, uh, probably a two, three-year-old baby, you know, that she's dragging with the other hand. Uh, I mean, I mean, I went home and cried. <laughs> I just, you know, it was, it was horrible. Escobar isn't just targeting Colombian police officers. At the top of his hit list is the DEA chief himself. There were two occasions where we put a price tag on my head. And um, DEA wanted to pull me out of the country. Um, the ambassador said, you're done here. And um, I fought it. Here I was working with the Colombians. I was asking to do this, I was providing an intelligence, and they're getting killed. And then there's a threat on my life and I'm gonna leave Colombia. Escobar has always been able to kill or threaten his way out of trouble. But the blood flowing in the streets of Medellin turns the tide against him. His, his uh, misbegotten thought, if you will, was that, hey, by doing that, uh, he would buy some time for himself or he would scare off the authorities. In fact, quite the opposite happened. Uh, it just angered people that much more uh, and uh, uh, they were gonna get him one way or the other. And in Joe Toft, Escobar has a relentless enemy. I didn't wanna leave Colombia without Escobar being either in jail or dead. As the DEA and search blocks step up the pressure, Escobar blindsides them with a move no one expected. On June 19th, 1991, he hands himself over to the Colombian authorities on the condition they deny US extradition requests. The DEA can only watch as a helicopter flies him out of their reach to a private prison. When Escobar turned himself in, we were extremely disappointed because we felt that we were really getting close to him. It was just a matter of time. Sentenced to just eight years on a minor drugs charge, the authorities think Escobar will be harmless behind bars. As much as the DEA did not approve, you have to understand that the government of Colombia was facing a situation they had never seen before. No government has ever seen it before, where a man was setting off explosives, paying off politicians, killing politicians, killing journalists, killing innocent civilians. What were they going to do? They were searching for a solution. From day one of his jail time, it's obvious that Escobar isn't going to suffer behind bars. The whole complex has been designed and built by his organization. Even the guards are on his payroll and no police are allowed within 12 miles. They had a discotheque, soccer field with lights, big TVs, best stereo sets you could come up with. There were double walls that uh, contained weapons, uh, money, drugs, you name it. I mean, it was not a prison, it was not a jail. It was country club living, basically. Joe Toft is disgusted by the one-sided deal. Everything was just, I mean, smell awful. I mean, it was just, it was a complete capitulation by, uh, by the government, uh, again, because of fear. With the search block and DEA off his back, Escobar has time to rebuild his drug empire. Thousands of kilos of cocaine are again on the move to the United States. And we knew that was happening. We had intelligence on this, and we had been providing information to the, to the government, to the president. Nobody wanted to acknowledge that, and, and I think that was part of the arrangement that they had with Escobar. A year later, protests about Escobar's luxurious conditions forced the government to order his transfer to a high-security prison. But nothing goes right. It was a combined army and police operation that was not well coordinated. Tipped off by his informants, Escobar is not ready to go quietly.
While his men try to hold off the troops sent for him, he breaks out and heads back to Medellin. Joe Toft and his team welcome the news. He had escaped from prison. He had violated his agreement. And it placed us in a position to be able to be much more focused and interactive with the government because they now saw that their strategy, their agreement with Pablo Escobar failed. You know, I remember <laughs> celebrating with the police officers that we trusted we worked with. It was a day, okay, we're back on, the game is back on, now we're gonna go out and get them. Once again, the elite Colombian search block unit and the DEA are back on the hunt. We realized immediately that we would be going back to work exclusively to try and track down Pablo Escobar. The Colombian government realizes there can be no more negotiation with Escobar. The $1 million reward for his capture is increased to $2.7 million by the Bush administration. But finding him won't be easy. Escobar enters an underground world of code names and aliases, of safe houses and ever-changing radio frequencies. He did it successfully for quite a while, you know, running around in that taxi, you know, with different costumes or whatever. But a new asset helps the DEA penetrate the fog of secrecy that has fallen over Escobar. Codenamed Centra Spike and operated by a top secret US Army intelligence unit. This is a flight of specially converted civilian light aircraft. Their state of the art radio direction finding equipment homes in on Escobar's radio telephone calls. The role of the US in terms of providing the, the, the high tech capability to track the phone calls. It was Clearly, absolutely crucial. Toft and his team feed information from Centra Spike to Colonel Martinez and the search block to help them locate his hideout. Sensing his pursuers closing in, Escobar ratchets up the violence. On January 30th, 1993, he tries unsuccessfully to kill the head of the Colombian security service with a car bomb. His car was going by and his car was a bulletproof vehicle. It blew the car to one side. There were half bodies of children and people all over the street that were waiting for the school bus. And when you see that, and, and you still think the guy's around, <laughs> it's hard for me to, you know, to understand that. 21 people are killed, many of them children, and dozens more terribly injured. By now, Escobar isn't only being hunted by the DEA and the Colombian government. Rival drug traffickers want him taken down too. You had the Cali cartel was furious with him um, because he had brought so much unwanted publicity to him and they were actively hunting him. Besides the Cali cartel, another murderous group is out to destroy him. They called themselves Los Perseguidos por Pablo Escobar, those persecuted by Pablo Escobar, or Los Pepes for short. Escobar can thank his own brutality for bringing Los Pepes into existence. Escobar had finally made enemies of his closest lieutenants by having them, you know, having their legs sawn off with chainsaws in his presence. Ah! Well, obviously he made enemies of them as they died, but, you know, of their families and, and, and those around him. The fact that many Los Pepes killers had been part of Escobar's organization gave them a huge advantage. They knew uh, about Escobar's infrastructure, they knew most of the people that worked for him. They knew pretty much everything about him. 
And so they systematically went out and started to hunt down Escobar's entourage and his remaining followers and uh, either took him out, out of commission or killed him outright. Now for every one of Escobar's attacks, there is a Los Pepes revenge killing. Walls started to crumble for Pablo. His attorneys were killed, his associates were killed. Other members of Pablo Escobar's distant family were killed. For the DEA, Los Pepes had a volatile new factor in an already complex and dangerous operation. When we became aware that the Los Pepes, who the Los Pepes were, you know, it was very important for DEA to recognize that and not in any way get tainted by the Los Pepes. I made sure every day as we shared our intelligence with the cops, asked the police to make sure that this does not end up in the hands of Los Pepes because I could just see that DEA provides intelligence that results in the killings of these people or something to that effect. So it would have been horrible. But there is no denying that these lethal vigilantes are crippling Escobar's network in a way the DEA and search bloc couldn't. Los Pepes were tremendously effective. And uh, I think they were key in uh, isolating Escobar fairly rapidly. They pretty much stripped him of much of his organization. Well, it, it was to our advantage. You gotta give Los Pepes a lot of credit for Pablo Escobar's demise, because they are the ones that wage the dirty war. The Los Pepes are really responsible for the fact that Pablo Escobar at the end was pretty much alone. I mean, he didn't have many people anymore. Under attack from all sides, Escobar disappears into the maze of Medellin's back streets. To stay in control of his organization, he uses a radio phone. Despite the risk of being tracked by police radio location teams on the ground and in the skies overhead. Escobar was very uh, streetwise. He knew what we were doing. And he knew that we were using directional finding equipment, uh, that we were monitoring his conversations. He never would speak from one place. Whenever he was talking on a, on a phone, he would always be moving because the triangulation is impossible to do if you're moving. And he knew that. Again and again, the search block raid Escobar's suspected hideouts, but every time he's tipped off before they can get him. I mean, the man was always prepared. He always had a escape route um, wherever he was at. He never stayed in a place more than a couple of days because he knew sooner or later intelligence would leak out as to where he was. Then on October 11th, 1993, Central Spike intercepts a call from Escobar to his wife. Triangulating on the signal, they pinpoint the location to an isolated farmhouse. Immediately, Colonel Martinez orders his search block to mount an operation. Journalist Simon Strong gets caught up in the action. He said, Simon, we're going now. We have a bead on where Escobar is. I mean, it was just a sort of a, a slow afternoon, and suddenly one's drawn into the operation, going up a mountainside. As the ground force close in on his hideout, US monitoring aircraft can still hear Escobar on the phone. The assault team gets the command, go. The keyed up troopers burst into the house, ready for an intense firefight but there is no sign of their prey. There were a lot of days that I thought this was gonna be the day we get Pablo. And um, it ended in disappointment. Escobar had gone to nearby woods to get a better signal for the call to his family. The brutal killer just won't cut contact with his wife, Maria Victoria, 16-year-old son, Juan Pablo, and nine-year-old daughter, Manuela. This gives Joe Toft 
a crucial tactical advantage. Focusing on his family, preventing the family from leaving Colombia was a very key factor. And once we recognized that and we emphasized that, we could see the end coming around. But the Los Pepes death squads, made up of Escobar's former gang members, have his family in their sights. On October 12th, Los Pepes detonate a massive bomb outside the family's apartment in Medellin. They escape with only minor injuries, but it's too close a call. Escobar is desperate to get them out of Colombia. His next move stuns the hardened DEA team. One day, um, the ambassador calls me and he says, Joe, he says, you're not gonna believe who's downstairs. And I said, who? And he says, Pablo Escobar's son. So I went down and met with him. The teenaged Juan Pablo walking into the embassy was surprise enough. But the deal his father proposes takes Toft's breath away. I was very impressed with the young man, um, with his maturity. And, uh, you know, he basically said, myself, my mom, and my sister uh, are afraid that we're going to get killed here by the Cali cartel. Would you please? help us get out of the country, we would like to get a visa to the United States. And I basically told them, I said, you know, if you came in here with a platter with the heads of the Cali cartel members, you still couldn't get a visa. Escobar realizes there's no chance of his family escaping to the United States. Europe seems their best chance to stay out of Los Pepe's reach. A last minute tip off alerts Toft that the Escobars are on the move. Agent Ken McGee races to the airport. We received intelligence that they were going to fly either to London, England, or to Frankfurt, Germany. And the planes were departing within 10 minutes of each other. We had tickets to jump on board either plane. With no power to arrest or detain the Escobars in Colombia, the DEA has to work behind the scenes to convince other nations to turn the family away. It was in our interest, as investigators, trying to find Pablo Escobar, that his family remain in Colombia. Therefore, by us providing this information to the host government of Germany, we would have the Escobars sent back to Colombia. During the flight, McGee secretly photographs the Escobars. He has to make sure they have no contact with other passengers. When I saw Pablo Escobar's young little daughter, I felt for that child. She was just an innocent young girl whose father was one of the most violent criminals on the face of the planet. When they land, it's obvious the German authorities have been warned about their unwelcome guests. When I arrived in Frankfurt, they stopped the aircraft in the middle of the runway. I remember taxiing down the runway, and I remember seeing tanks, police cars, all lined along the airstrip. and they escorted the Escobars off the aircraft and took them into uh, a quarantined area, so to speak, in regards to determining what they were going to do with the Escobars. Thanks to top-level contact between the German and Colombian governments, it doesn't take long for the Escobars to be given the news. Their plea for asylum is rejected. When he gets the news, Escobar goes into meltdown. The minute he heard that Germany had denied the request, he was on the phone making threats, calling the German embassy, saying he would kill people, saying he would blow things up. There was no telling what would happen. When they get back to Colombia, Escobar's family are taken to a hotel in the capital, Bogota, under heavy police guard. As expected, Escobar immediately calls his wife. The plan to take him down is on a knife edge. The walls were caving in around Pablo Escobar. He was taking more risks. He was making more phone calls. He was also becoming more threatening. 
in his tones. His acts of desperation made us feel that we were getting closer and closer and closer. The noose is tightening around Colombian drug overlord Pablo Escobar. On December 2nd, 1993, a police radio location team intercepts a call he makes to his son. He was so angry at his family not being allowed to leave the country that he started calling from, uh, from one site. And that's how we're, you know, the police was able to uh, triangulate and find him. The commander of the search block, Colonel Hugo Martinez, has given the job of tracing Escobar's calls to the one man he knows he can trust absolutely, his own son. So you have father and son in the world of criminal organization, and you have father and son in the world of law enforcement and what stands for right, good versus evil. The phone trace leads the younger Martinez to a quiet residential street. Suddenly, he sees a figure at a second-story window. Every man in the Colombian police and DEA knows that face. It's Escobar. We immediately contacted his superiors, to include his father, to say exactly where he was at and what he had found. With just two men, Martinez calls urgently for backup. Search block patrols race desperately to Martinez's location. When they get there, they don't waste a second. They arrived at this location and they immediately hit the place. Even when cornered, Escobar shows how dangerous he can be. He was armed with two semi-automatic pistols. Escobar jumps from a back window to the roof of another house. He had no idea that the place was surrounded. When he jumped out into the roof, he was shooting back at the window, thinking that he was being chased. He was hit three times. He was wounded. He continued fire. Escobar goes down in a hail of fire. Pablo Escobar, that day, lived up to his reputation as being a notorious, cold-blooded killer that fought to the very end. At 3.03 p.m., a search block officer is the first to reach Escobar's body. When Pablo Escobar was killed on that rooftop, the very first message transferred over the radio was, Viva Colombia, matamos a Pablo Escobar. Long live Colombia, we've just killed Pablo Escobar. The men of the search block have at last settled the score. They were elated. They were ecstatic. They were jubilant. You could use many words to describe how they felt, but one word most importantly is that they were proud. 150 miles away in Bogota, Joe Toft gets the news he has been waiting to hear for six long years. I scream, I say, Pablo is dead, you know. Pablo is finally dead, I was ecstatic. The news of Escobar's death is flashed to Washington, and for the DEA, it's mission accomplished. He had become a cancer to Colombia, and people were tired of his brand of terrorism because he was a narco-terrorist in every sense of the word. Escobar was a monster. I, I wish he would have spent the rest of his life in prison. I mean, that's what I wanted. But um, he deserved what he got. Oh. 
even for Joe Toft, the successful end to the Escobar case has its downside. I have three kids that I left behind. And uh, to this day, I feel guilt for my first marriage, you know, of um, having left them. And if I had to do it over again, I would not go because of my kids. Other than that, for me, I mean, I had the greatest job in the world. I had, I mean, I was the head of the office going after Pablo Escobar. I think every DEA agent would, would have liked to have had that job. <laughs> the death of Pablo Escobar has given new life to Colombia. There are many people that think of Colombia, and the first thing they think of is Pablo Escobar and drug trafficking. But that's not true. He was a major deal in Colombia. But Pablo Escobar is not Colombia, and Colombia is not Pablo Escobar. The people of Colombia are wonderful people. Escobar's cocaine empire left a trail of death from Colombia to the USA and across the globe. Pablo Escobar was the biggest criminal on the face of the planet. And the world will never see a criminal that big. There will be drug traffickers, there will be other criminals, but no one will grow to have that amount of power.